Good morning and welcome. As we navigate this historic time for climate change, racial equity, and public health, the built environment sits front and center. New city, state, and federal climate policies are being enacted, and new technologies are being deployed at scale. These will affect all three of these arenas for generations to come. But this is certain. This is the moment for lasting change. And you, you are the leaders that can make it happen. Our conference will investigate how we can approach policy and building design for climate, equity, and health together and leave behind the false choices of the past that sometimes compromised and pit one against the other for those compromised outcomes. No more false choices for climate equity and health. Today, we'll see how we make that happen. Before we jump in, I'd like to take a minute to review Urban Green's organizational values. These values guide our work and they're part of our commitment to an inclusive and respectful dialogue. We ask that everyone keep these values in mind during our discussion. Now, if you're having any technical difficulties during today's conference, please email contact at urbangreencouncil.org and we'll try to get those sorted out as quickly as possible. Now, we wanna hear from you through your questions. So when you want to submit questions, please do so via the Slido box below your video screen. You can upvote any questions that you see there and we'll try to get to as many as possible. You can also access Slido on your phone by visiting slido.com and entering the code UGC. Finally, we're coming to you from our brand new studio, Urban Green in Lower Manhattan. I hope you like the enhanced experience, not only for this conference, but all of our future programs. Events like these are made possible through the generosity of our sponsors. And we're grateful to have two sponsors for today's conference today. Our lead sponsor is Carrier. So thank you very much to our friends at Carrier for your longstanding support, not only for this conference, but over the many years. Please take a look at this short video from Carrier. Confidence is at the heart of everything we do at Carrier. Our systems fill buildings and homes with healthy, clean air. We detect and put out fires and help people stay safe and secure inside. Our innovations keep foods and life-saving medicines cold and fresh until they reach those who need them. At Carrier, we create solutions to help you build a brighter future. Inspiring confidence, Carrier. Thank you again to our friends at Carrier. So let's get started. Our first keynote speaker is a national voice right here from New York City. Peggy Shepard is co-founder and executive director of We Act for Environmental Justice. She has a long history of organizing and engaging Northern Manhattan residents in community-based campaigns to address environmental protection and environmental health policy. She has successfully combined grassroots organizing, advocacy, and research to become a national leader in environmental policy and the perspective of, of environmental justice in urban communities. And Peggy's voice just got stronger when President Biden appointed her to the new White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Peggy, we're thrilled to have you at the conference today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. And uh, good morning to you all. Good morning to Urban Green. Well, we begin today's conference with a mandate, no more false choices. Now, that's the new cool message that's being stood up. But let's ask ourselves, are we really ready to walk up the talk as we start another day with the public recognition that we're in the midst of a racial pandemic, a COVID-19 pandemic and all its variants and a climate crisis that we're racing to head off. Now, many of us here today are climate activists. We're ready to lead the nation, our, our region up the path toward achieving a just, responsible, an ethical climate changed future. And we can achieve decarbonization and a safer future by advocating for policies and initiatives that protect the most vulnerable communities of our country. And we can do that by taking action to create a just transition to a clean renewable energy economy and future. But to do so, 
We have to ground our climate policy solutions in the understanding that climate change and exposure to pollution does not harm all communities equally. And to succeed, we need to unite for collective action, which means we need to understand each other, our experiences, our perspectives, and align our values. Otherwise, those dynamics can become obstacles that impede our progress together. So we ask ourselves, what decisions and investments do we need to make to ensure that we meet our climate targets and avoid the worst of the climate crisis? How will a forthcoming COVID-19 recovery and the ongoing inequality and racism help or hinder the equitable and ethical implementation of these ideas? Now to our credit, diverse stakeholders are coming together to develop new policies at the city, state, and federal levels to address the most difficult challenges all our communities and sectors are experiencing. Policies like the New York State Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, the boldest climate change policy in the nation, and Justice 40, where the Biden administration aims to distribute 40% of the benefits of energy investments to frontline communities. And the New York City Council just recently approved racial equity reports for many land use applications and for historic district designations. But we're also going to need to develop new models, policies and interventions that address the ethical and human rights dimensions of global warming, the impacts of the built environment on our health and well-being, the disproportionate burden of legacy pollution and the unsustainable rise in energy costs for low income families. Now, as we work to transform our climate future and our fossil fuel economy, we're challenged to ensure that race cannot be a barrier to opportunity, life expectancy, freedom of movement, a healthy environment and home, and a fair policing and equal protection under the law. But before I discuss our challenges, I wanna give you some definitions to guide our conversation. Uh, could I have the slides, please? So I wanna give you a few key terms. So one of the uh, deadliest aspects of systemic racism is environmental racism, which really results in the disproportionate exposure to pollution and other environmental hazards in low-income communities uh, and communities of color. So environmental justice, what is that? It's a civil rights analysis of environmental decision-making. It's realized through a global movement to raise awareness of environmental racism and to develop, implement, and enforce programs and policies to ensure that everyone, regardless of their race or income, can live, work, and play in a healthy environment. So that's environmental justice, what we're trying to achieve. A frontline community, we hear a lot about that. That is a community that's disproportionately burdened by environmental hazards, which are cumulative and come from multiple sources. Now, many of these communities, um, which tend to be communities of color and indigenous, have historically been dumping grounds for facilities that produce pollution, and some of these communities also um, are fence line to industrial facilities. And next, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, what is an environmental justice organization? A lot of people ask me that question. It's a grassroots group in a frontline community that is directed by community members representative of that community. And it works to organize residents and build power to address the challenges of pollution, inequity, and exclusion from decision-making that affects the community's health and sustainability. Climate justice is a global movement to address the climate crisis in a just and equitable way with communities of color um, being the first hit and worst hit by the impacts of climate change. And finally, a just transition 
refers to shifting from an economy run on fossil fuels, which are the cause of climate change, uh, to one that is powered by renewable energy. And to make this transition just, we need to ensure that workers in the fossil fuel industry are prepared and retrained for a pipeline to clean energy jobs that are family sustaining and that communities of color are prioritized for renewable energy projects and infrastructure, decarbonization and electrification, energy efficiency and sustainability measures, uh, and that they are have access to the new jobs that are created. So again, um, those are a few definitions to, to really uh, to guide our discussion today. Um, but we do have a number of challenges. We're challenged to create a Green New Deal for public housing, which is in gross disrepair in New York City. Housing in the built environment creates an environmental condition that can promote well-being or threaten the health and life expectancy of millions of Americans. Extreme heat, which worsens each year as a result of climate change, can vary significantly from block to block, impacting the premature death of which Black New Yorkers comprise 50% of those deaths. We also know that 30 million households in this country are energy insecure and need access to cost-saving renewable energy to keep their housing affordable. So we're challenged to expand access to cost-saving renewable energy initiatives that create family-sustaining jobs in communities that are burdened by energy insecurity and to oppose efforts by utilities to limit consumer choice in renewable energy deployment. We also know that the US Department of Energy will focus on how to leverage resources to increase the amount of distributed energy resources, clean energy resources that are going on the grid in frontline communities. And the goal, the goal is deeper resilience, economic security, and filling the gap that has been created by this pandemic that has devastated frontline communities. Yet we cannot undertake this ambitious agenda without understanding, acknowledging, and addressing effectively that the underlying causes of the environmental justice and climate crisis has a complex legacy. It's one of housing segregation, discrimination in land use and zoning policy, natural resource exploitation, and exploitive fossil fuel economy, and the disparate enforcement of environmental laws that remains a hurdle to equal environmental protection. And as a result of these dynamics, whether you work in government, nonprofits, academia, business, or industry, to be effective, we must integrate justice and equity across all agencies, policies, through our investment priorities, and most importantly, how we frame our objectives and outcomes. Now, as co-chair of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, I am aware that President Biden's agenda, first of all, recognizes the interconnected crisis that is facing our Black, Latinx, tribal, and low-income communities. And secondly, he will work to make groundbreaking investments that will cut pollution from the power sector modernize water infrastructure and clean up legacy pollution that's gone unaddressed for far too long. Now, we also know that EPA Administrator Michael Regan has committed to strengthening the enforcement of the bedrock environmental laws in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to ensure that violations in environmental justice communities do not go unpunished. And as a result, President Biden appointed yesterday a former environmental crimes prosecutor from the Department of Justice to lead this effort at the EPA. Administrator Regan has also stated that the administration's investment strategy would complement, not replace EPA's commitment to use its authority under the Clean Air Act to reduce harmful air pollution from power plant smokestacks. He emphasized that even if the administration or Congress decides to pursue a clean energy standard, that the EPA will continue to use its authority to clean up power plants. And why does he mention the clean energy standard? 
because the current proposal is seen by many advocates to promote false solutions. Now, instead of false solutions, environmental justice organizations are urging the adoption of a pollution-free renewable energy standard that would produce pollution-free electricity that would not include nuclear energy, carbon capture and storage, carbon capture utilization and storage, natural gas, biomass, or waste incineration of any type. Because nuclear energy produces dangerous life cycle externalities, including mining hazards and waste material that's been harmful to indigenous communities. Carbon capture and storage not only enables continued oil production, it can also pump more carbon into the air than it removes. And the infrastructure associated with it can endanger frontline communities. We know that waste burning facilities are disproportionately cited in environmental justice communities and that they exacerbate local air pollution and emit significant amounts of greenhouse gases. So a pollution free renewable energy standard would not allow dirty energy technologies to be credited, traded or purchased. It would also not use carbon intensity thresholds. Now, both of these approaches prolong the use of false solutions. And we need to be mindful of the local law 97 buildings emissions trading study, which again may not be good for low income communities. But we also know today that many state and federal agencies are asking some very basic questions. How do we actually track our dollars and drive more investments to meet Justice 40 goals? How can we really show impact, both the legacy and the promise? How can we create more communities of opportunity? And to ensure a safe and sustainable nation, we must focus on the intersectionality of the built environment, transportation, energy, flood mitigation, because past history has shown us that when we disconnect those elements, the most vulnerable communities are left behind and do not receive their fair share of dollars. So how can we ensure that there's a robust environmental justice analysis that is normally far less robust than the cost benefit analyses and environmental impact statements that agencies and industry repair? Well, we can incorporate equity into cost benefit analysis by reporting costs and benefits on discrete population segments, such as income groups. We can develop guidance on how to incorporate distributional analyses into decision-making. We can coordinate with scientific and economic experts to assess the effects on frontline communities. And now that there's more granular spatial modeling available, it allows organizations to better assess pollution at local levels and to incorporate disparate demographic risk factors. And of course, the more monetization of localized air toxins would enable us to quantify the cost of pollution in frontline communities. So we can all develop screening criteria for the policies we develop. For instance, was the policy developed with direct input of all the communities impacted? Does the policy directly address disparity? Will the policy favor more affluent communities? Will funding be made available for low-income communities and communities of color to ensure that they share in the benefits? Is there adequate enforcement to ensure that these communities receive equal environmental protection? And how do we ensure that the monies to frontline communities actually get to those communities and are not detoured by state and local governments? And how do we learn to listen and take action? For instance, why is it always, well, we want to engage with the community and hear your concerns, but it's rarely we've heard your concerns and we're going to implement systemic changes. And here's our implementation plan so, so that you can all hold us accountable. That's what we need to start hearing because it's time to rebuild trust between institutions government, philanthropy, and grassroots and frontline communities. We have the challenge and we have the opportunity 
to expand democratic space for all our voices to be heard and incorporated into solutions that work for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Urban Green. Peggy, thank you uh, so much. I can't think of a better uh, framing overview for our conference today. We really appreciate uh, your uh, valuable perspective. Um, I'll invite the audience to remember to submit questions uh, via Slido for Peggy, but we're going to start um, with a couple now. Uh, Peggy, tell us how history can help inform how we do things differently uh, as we go forward for environmental justice, as we think about climate equity and health. You, you've done such tremendous groundbreaking work um, in the past. I'm wondering, are there lessons there that we can learn uh, as society on how we do things differently going forward? Well, first of all, we have to, when we have our meetings, we have to look around the room and understand whether we have the diverse perspectives in that room to adequately begin to address new policies. We have to understand that market-based solutions have not benefited communities of color and low income. We have to understand that states, that, that the federal government has devolved its authority to states, which have not done a good job on environmental enforcement, have not done a good job on continuing to permit um, polluting facilities in overburdened communities. So we need to take a look at our per permitting policies in our states. Uh, we need to understand that we cannot continue to exclude um, the, voices, the voices of the most affected people by our policies. Questions are coming in, great, keep them coming. Um, let's start at the big picture level before we, we uh, come down to the city level. So I'm curious to know the, the mandate of uh, the White House Advisory Council that you're co-chairing and um, the activities and initiatives that you uh, foresee coming out from that over the next few months. So our mandate has been to provide, uh, to initially provide advice in three key areas. One is Justice 40 which is again, um, the commitment to uh, invest 40% of uh, energy benefits in frontline communities. Um, the second uh, area of work is around um, really developing uh, a robust executive order that um, you know, amends the current order that was developed under the Clinton administration and then um, continued under the Obama administration, but really looking at that executive order and adding in the kinds of accountability, the kinds of interagency collaboration. Um, also looking at a scorecard of how we evaluate whether the various federal agencies have advanced environmental justice and have committed um, their investments of the 40% of those uh, benefits of investments to frontline communities. And then the third bucket of work has been to help develop and ab help advise a climate uh, and economic uh, justice screening tool that would map uh, and identify environmental justice communities. And that would also uh, help us track where those agency investments uh, have gone. So those three buckets of work, we have made uh, recommendations already in those areas in those first 100 days. And so we are now focused on how do we ensure that the Justice 40 monies actually get to the communities they are designed to help. Um, we, we know that often money comes down from the federal government through states and cities and that money does not get uh, to the most impacted communities. We, we know that money, for instance, after hurricanes in the Gulf Coast did not get to the black uh, and brown communities that were most impacted. And some of those communities are still not whole after what, 10 years or more since uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina. So, uh, so again, um, those have been 
uh, the mandates. We are also uh, working now on a scorecard uh, to develop metrics uh, where we can um, evaluate and measure the uh, progress of, of key agencies. So again, um, that work is continuing on a scorecard and a screening tool. So here's a, here's a great audience follow-up question to that, Peggy. Is action more effective at the national level or the local level? We need all of those, um, we need all of that happening simultaneously. Uh, local policies impact our communities. State policies uh, impact us. Federal policies impact us. So it's not enough, um, you know, at We Act for Environmental Justice, uh, where I'm co-founder and director, you know, our theory of change is that we organize the most affected people by policies to engage in decision making around those policies. And so, again, um, we've got to uh, continue to do that kind of, uh, of organizing at a local, state and federal level if we're going to have sustainable communities. Part of the uh, remarkable success that you've had at your organization has been this foundation in data, which I know has been a, a big part of, uh, of, of the work that you do. What are the data needs that are required to bring equity and health and climate together? Uh, let me tell you, um, <laughs> um, when the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, developed its recommendations around the screening tool, there is a long list of metrics there. Um, we certainly need to look at the status um, uh, and health of, of people uh, and populations in communities. We need to understand and, and understand those health disparities. We need to uh, look at uh, income levels. We need to look at susceptibility of specific populations like pregnant women, children, uh, and the elderly. Um, we need to look at issues of housing segregation, uh, energy burden. Um, we know that, of course, um, so many people in this country cannot afford energy costs, and those costs may rise initially as we transition uh, to uh, uh, to a, a energy uh, clean energy economy, and so there are numbers of metrics that we need to look at. Um, are you in a flood zone? Um, are you uh, at the waterfront? Um, are you impacted by extreme heat? Um, so there are numbers of metrics that we need to develop together with communities. Um, and some of those, of course, will um, will change from region to region uh, because there are clear regional differences uh, in environmental impacts. Um, and so again, we need to look at those. If you were in California, you'd be looking at, at wildfires and drought and water usage. Um, you might be looking at where lead pipes are. Um, many cities are beginning to map um, where those lead pipes are. And uh, there's mapping now in New York City that begins to show where those lead pipes are. And many of them are in uptown neighborhoods as well. So again, working through focus groups, working through consultation with communities to develop those metrics that we should be uh, looking at, at as an important screen. Great, I think we have time for one more question. We've got a, a minute left. Um, we're at a, a pivotal moment of political change in New York uh, with a new mayor and a new council uh, on the horizon. Um, what are the short term policies or strategies that you see that we can advance environmental justice in New York City? Well, first, we've got to uh, really begin to engage the community around these issues. Um, when you ask community about environment and climate, um, they don't necessarily think of many of their community impacts in that way. So we really have to have stronger dialogue. We now have a New York City Environmental Justice Advisory Board, and we again need to have the resources um, uh, at the city level to ensure that that office can run 
uh, effectively and can engage the community effectively. I think this new um, uh, law passed by the city council uh, yesterday, looking at um, uh, the racial um, uh, demographics of, of communities when we're undergoing certain kinds of land use and rezonings and historic designations is very important. And of course, um, ensuring that um, our lead poisoning prevention laws are adequately enforced um, is another issue. But I, I could certainly go on and on <laughs> on that question. I could too. I have a million questions, but uh, we're out of time for this segment. So Peggy Shepard, thank you so much for joining us today. We're grateful for your participation. We're grateful for your perspective and we're grateful for all the work you're doing, particularly now on the national level. So I ask our audience to give us a, a virtual round of applause uh, for, for Peggy Shepard. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you so much to Urban Green and all of your great work. Thank you. Thanks.